Welcome back to F1 Wars. We're going to dive straight back in to the series and we're going to talk about a more recent example. The last series was about the Suzuka Grand Prix of 1989. And because it's an off week, we're going to talk about the most topical events, the recent events at the Japanese Grand Prix of 2019, 30 years later, and we still have controversy. But this time it's of the different sort and it involves Ferrari. The Japanese Grand Prix was filled with early action and controversy. It was deemed by the FAA that Leclerc on his first lap incident with Max Verstappen was at fault. Leclerc himself admitted as much. Penalties were handed out, fines levied. All is well, right? That would be a short story if that were the case. There's a lot more at play, and a lot has been misunderstood or just flat out misreported. You couple that with the fact that a lot of this stuff is very hard to find, and it makes a very difficult story to wade through and actually talk about facts. But that's what we're going to talk about today. Facts. I'm going to cite all the sources, you can check them in the description below. And when I involve my bias, I will make sure to make that very clear. I also encourage you to triple check every single thing I send you. And if you remember how we did the layout of the F1 Wars with Cineverse Prost, we're going to talk about the things that people are already having in their head and these misconceptions, because that's the first barrier when trying to have a conversation about these things. So the objective today, expose the real extent of the danger exhibited by Leclerc, but mostly by Ferrari as a team, as they made it very clear that they showed the grid, they value points over the lives of the drivers on the grid. In order to tell this story, we have to first understand what actually happened in the series events, because this is where most of the issues and the misunderstandings happen. Most people are not citing the actual transcripts. They're not looking at when certain things were said and what was conspicuously left out in rationale, logic, and in these communications. Let's start out with the rough timeline. Lap one. The start is where things go wrong for Ferrari. Vettel does a jump start. We're not gonna talk about the penalty or the lack of penalty there. That's for a different time and different conversation. For whatever reason, it could have been because of Vettel, but it's likely it could have just been because he had a bad start, but Leclerc gets off the line very poorly. Vettel's poor start actually gets him behind Botas, who ends up going around him on the left. Now Leclerc is behind his teammate. Leclerc's poor start puts him in a vulnerable position for Max Verstappen to actually come on the outside. Vettel's poor start makes it so that he has to sit behind Botas. And because he has a compromised start, and Leclerc also has a poor start, he's a lot closer to Vettel than he'd probably like to be going through that turn. Being that close to Vettel introduces a lot of aerodynamic issues. You start to introduce the possibility of understeer, which is exactly what happened. Verstappen approaches from the outside. His move boxes Leclerc in. Leclerc really has no option. Now, whether on accident or on purpose, we'll never really know except Verstappen, but it's very smart racecraft on his part. Boxing Leclerc in makes it so that he can advance. The problem is it now exposed Verstappen to a driver error that would knock him out of the race, which is exactly what happened. Leclerc goes through the S-curves. Leclerc continues his drive, assessing the situation in his car, feeling out the balance of his car. Doesn't actually radio in to his engineers. Hamilton's garage updates Hamilton about Leclerc's situation before Leclerc's does. Hamilton's garage says, we think Leclerc has front wing damage. Just after that, Leclerc radios in. I've got damage. Leclerc's garage radios back. Copy. We're checking it. Oh, I've got damage. Copy. We are checking it. Shortly after that, Hamilton's garage radios back to him. So Leclerc's damage is to the left-hand side of his car. May jettison some components. Okay, it's very important to take a micro pause here. Hamilton's garage is already assessing the fact that the damage is bad enough that he's going to start losing parts. So keep note of that. If a competitive team can look at a car and warn their driver, unless they're trying to incite their driver in some way that's unnecessary, could it be that the damage is so obvious that even other teams are warning their drivers? The teams don't have secret access footage of other teams. They're just using the exact same thing we're all looking at. F1 TV conveniently shows everything the teams look at. In fact, if you look in the garage and some of these broadcasts, they're watching the exact same things we are. So I add that extended explanation to make sure that we're on the same page. Immediately, other teams are warning their drivers, in particular, Hamilton. This is important. And it's a good time also to say that we have all of the radio. Only one person can talk to the driver. There is no secret radio. 
And if you're watching these things live and you pick the driver on board, you get the exact same radio they are broadcasting. Now, there are gaps in terms of some drivers don't have their radio on for whatever reason, or that maybe there's an error or there's some sort of interruption. But these transcripts are what happened. They're silent with their driver until about turn 15. That's where we have it lined up in which Leclerc's garage says to Leclerc, box now, box. It's worth noting that this is a great example of why doing this research is so important. After making this, like I said, I've spent days and, and dozens of hours. I've actually switched my position on this. Based on what Leclerc is told and when, I can totally understand why he stayed out. Box now, box. Box now, box. Why? Why it was too late? Copy, understood. Even if you want to assume that he didn't have the best motive, he knew for sure that he had damage. That's a fact. He still chose to stay out despite the team telling him to come in. But if you listen to when the team told him to come in and how they told him, as a driver, my entire position prior was based on and predicated about him having damage, therefore he needed to come in. And if the team tell you to come in, it's reasonable to assume it's because of the damage. Now that falls apart when you hear how they tell him to come in and when they tell him to come in. And I really do believe in this situation, even if he was paying close attention, I still can't let him off the hook because he would have said, how's the car? And he chose not to. So I haven't totally switched my position, but I do give him a lot more credit here. He is a driver, just like I would give anyone else the same benefit. They're not designed to be thinking about worst case scenario with the car. Now, we can't let them be stupid about what they're doing and think, but I don't think that's what this was. I truly think based on this, unless we have proof that he knew how bad that wing was, which I still at this point don't think he did. I think he felt damage. I think he noticed the damage more than the mirror. And I don't think it's until he gets on the start finish line of the second lap, just like the team sort of regret it, that he starts to feel it. So at that point, I really can't fault him too much. He still should have come in. He had damage. End of story. But listen to what they say and how they say it and when they say it. Box now, box. Box now, box. It's not that convicting. He's trying to understand. In my opinion, when he says it, why? He says that in a way that says, what's going on? If they were going to bring him in because there was damage, it would have been a lot more clear. Like it is on other laps. Like it is on the very next lap. So, again, to summarize that, he's still in the wrong. He knew he had damage. He chose not to come in. But they also didn't tell him to come in because of the damage. And if it was damage, and at that point you're conceding the game plan to not talk about it openly for plausible deniability, well, at that point, why wouldn't you just say come in and fix it? Because that's exactly what they do on lap three when he uh, appeals to the fact that they need to come in. They say, well, just come in and fix the nose cone. Why are we coming in to fix the nose cone? Well, now all of a sudden we're talking about it. I wonder why. So we'll get to that. But I can understand what Leclerc is confused about because he's like, look, if you're not telling me that we're coming in because of damage, then we're still playing the game. And so at that point, why would you go? If you're him, why would you go in if the team is still not choosing to say it's because of damage? Mind you, Mercedes team was already acknowledging that parts are likely going to fall off. You would think that they don't just say that to five, likely six time world champion Lewis Hamilton unless... They were pretty confident in that because he's going to change how he drives. How is it that Hamilton can get that information, but Ferrari can't give it to Leclerc? So again, let me let me be clear. Let's separate and distinguish the fact that this does not make Leclerc innocent. And again, if the penalty was here and it stopped here and he pit even on the next lap, I would think that this is appropriate. So it seems very difficult that someone could argue with the fact that he deserves at least some penalty if we stopped here. The problem is we don't. So now we're through the first lap, we're starting the second lap. At this point, the front wing is totally intact still for the most part. The piece connecting his front mirror to his body is totally off, flew off the second the impact was made, and he knows that's the case. He's also aware of the fact that his front wing has some form of damage that is affecting his car. Additionally, let's be reminded of the fact that Leclerc didn't ask the extent of the damage. 
you need to explain to your driver the extent of their damage so they can protect not only the other drivers around them, but their own race so they don't have to deal with the penalty later. Maybe the driver will say, I want to come in. You never really know unless you explain it. I'm actually still in the camp that Leclerc is a good person. And if you told him his front wing was that damaged, he would have come in. I think he really would have come in. I think 10 out of 10, Ferrari would repeat the same choice. And that much we can prove. In an interview after the race, Mattia was quoted as saying, Charles is the one that is driving and can feel the car, how it behaves. From the outside, we saw that the wing was broken, so it would have to be changed at some stage. But at that stage, he felt he'd got still the right pace and stayed out. That right there, that alone, is just a bold-faced lie. The garage is the, is the one that tells the driver their pace. The driver doesn't dictate to the garage their pace. They tell the garage how the car feels on the pace they're given. And if you listen to any team radio, you will hear, and even in this race, I went back and listened, Leclerc asked, how's my pace, five times, just like he does every other race, because that's what drivers do. The drivers don't tell the garage the pace. Ferrari is trying to position this as if it was Leclerc's call. And they are essentially, subtly throwing Leclerc under the bus. They are hiding behind the fact that their driver wanted to stay out. But the driver cannot see the extent of the damage. And therefore, hindsight, he would have 100% come in because what happened on lap two is the issue. Now, it becomes immediately on the second lap, and they're not even through the finish line straight. Parts start to come off. Hamilton comes on radio and says, it's dangerous. Parts are flying out. And you can actually see them. And if you can see them, and I can see them, guess who else can see them? You got it. Ferrari. I'm actually not comfortable saying Leclerc can see all of this yet. I believe at some stage, some of these sparks get so severe, he 100% can feel it. I can hear it from naked audio in the car. And I believe there is a point which he can see them too. As they approach the first turn, Lewis's garage exiting the turn one and going into turn two says to him, copy Lewis, don't take any risks. Now you start to see Lewis actually give up the slipstream. I'm also going to use this to be reasonable and say, if you were Leclerc and notice, huh, he's not going for the slipstream. I wonder why. And you know, you have damage. I'd like to think that he's a smart guy and can understand. Maybe it's not safe for him to be right behind me. Maybe that's a sign. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now they are through the S's on turn two and Leclerc radios to his garage approaching Degner, Degner one. And he says, why don't we continue a little bit more again at this point? He, I believe, can't see things falling off. Ferrari's garage absolutely can. Lewis's garage can see things falling off. And Lewis's garage is certainly telling the FIA that things are falling off. And we have confirmation of that as well. Michael Massey is now getting involved. And there are quite a lot of misunderstandings about this as well. So when you go back and really study what is said, when you catalog all the chain of events and all of the interviews, and I've got them all for you, here is the factual timeline of what happened. Upon the incident in lap one, Leclerc was deemed that there was no investigation necessary on his part. Now, I'm not going to insert what I think could have been at play here. A lot of people have. I'm not going to do that. But surely it doesn't make a lot of sense if you can see visible damage to say at least that the driver should not get it repaired. It is at this point Michael Massey has openly said, Ferrari told us after the first lap when they chose not to come in that they were going to come in on lap two. I'm not going to assume malice here. I'm just going to assume incompetence that the FIA should have brought him in. I am going to say, though, they did trust Ferrari to make the right decision. Some people have taken it a step further and say they have given them the leniency and the benefit. If that wing would have stayed on, he would have been able to race at least until lap 18, which is where he was probably scheduled to make his first stop anyway. And we'll get into this later, but this is a lot like Carlos Sainz in Singapore in 2016 with Red Bull when... One of the last times this prominently happened and he was given the black flag with the orange circle. He didn't want to compromise his race, but naturally he was told to come in and he came in. So frankly, I can be understanding and say, yes, that was a horrible decision for the FAA to trust a team to bring the driver in. Honestly, Ferrari, at the same time, it's ridiculous to not bring your driver in. Just two issues in a perfect storm of everyone trusting each other. 
I think that's the rosy eyed view and I'm going to take it for the sake of this video and to be objective. Now, that is when that stops. If Ferrari tell Massey that they are going to bring their driver in, that's either they are very stupid, which I'm going to say that's not the case, or, or they let this happen. If Ferrari saw the damage and chose not to bring him in, what makes you think that they were going to bring him in on lap two, regardless of what happened? And to make matters worse, which we'll get into because we all know what happens, they still didn't bring him in lap three. Ask yourself, at what point would they ever have brought him in? The answer is until he literally was either forced or it was in time and on his race strategy on his first stop, which is probably about lap 16. And even looking at Matias' comments, he confirms this openly with brazen boldness. Their actions and his interview shows that they were 100% prepared to drive however long they needed to, to make that work, to make their strategy still in play. Think about how much of that carbon fiber would have ended up on the track. Think about how many dangerous situations would have occurred. Okay, so let's get back to the chain of events now. They are still approaching Degner 1. Leclerc says... Why don't we continue a little bit more? Why don't we continue a little bit more? We need to box this lap box. Upon exiting Degner 2, this becomes even more apparent that Lewis is very aware of it as well. He radios to his garage. It could fall off at any point. Lewis Hamilton is driving behind Leclerc saying it could fall off at any point. It could fall off at any point. You can even look at the playback. It's clear it's about to fall off. And approaching turn 10, Leclerc's garage says to him, we need to box this lap. Copy box, but just to let you know, the car doesn't feel that bad. I know it probably looks bad, but the car is quite okay. But the car is quite okay. The car is quite okay. The car is quite okay. Oh, I don't know, eh? Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look, it's just a flesh wound. Leclerc responds at the hairpin. Copy box, but just to let you know, the car doesn't feel that bad. I know it probably looks bad, but the car is quite okay. Here is where we're in the territory of everyone is in the wrong at Ferrari. Here is where Leclerc implicates himself. He is now telling his garage, arguing back with them that the car is fine. His car is falling apart while he's driving. Again, unless you're openly admitting Claire is not intelligent enough or talented enough of a driver to feel the aerodynamic change in his vehicle. And let's say you even don't want to go there. His mirror is so flimsy at this point, it gets to the point where he actually holds it with his hand. He reaches out and grabs it. So how many turns was he prepared to drive through where he was going to go one handed going 200 plus miles an hour, going through some of the most technical and dangerous turns in the world? Again, I think it goes much deeper than this, but we, what we can say with 100% certainty and factual evidence is even if you just looked at what you can see, that right there alone is very, very dangerous. And you could be listening to this going, yes, yeah, that's why he got the penalty. It goes even further. So Leclerc is telling his team after they confirm you need to box. He's telling his team that, hey, it's fine. And what that should say to you and what it, at least it says to me and you make your own judgment. It says to me that he's trying to convince his garage, hey, let's stay out here. And notice his team doesn't warn him. They don't explain to him. They don't tell him anything else. This isn't on accident. It falls under the idea of plausible deniability. The less you say over radio, the less you'll have to explain. The problem is it creates a murky situation like the one we're in now where these teams and these drivers are getting lenient responses when it's because we can't prove motive. But the problem is they showed too much and they said too much. So now he says to his team, the car's fine. When it's clearly not, he's lying and he's holding his mirror with his bare hand hanging out the window. And here's where we get to another very important piece of the story. Probably the entire piece that matters the most is there is a straightaway between 130R and Spoon. It's important to nail down the timeline. The timeline is 
Leclerc just got through telling his team that the car is actually fine. I know it looks bad again. Another reference to he understands at least that it looks bad. And if it was just a mirror, why would he be saying it looks bad? They enter a very fast straightaway in which the cars try to pick up speed and make up ground before they enter 130R. Leclerc still hasn't heard anything back, so he says to them, do you confirm me to box? Do you confirm me that we need to box? The second that radio is done, you see him reach up frantically for his mirror. Something changed in that car to make him reach up and grab that mirror. Now, naturally, yes, he's been grabbing the mirror. It's because it's been loose, but something made him do it right then. And the second he ended up reaching for it, it turns out that that is the time when the piece flew off. Isn't it reasonable to assume that when that piece flew off, something else happened in the car, which is important because that means he felt something go and it was much more than the mirror. And as we can see, that is the part that could have seriously injured Hamilton. And if you are even watching the race, you saw it. You didn't miss it. Ferrari didn't miss it. They just didn't care. Look how large of debris this is. Look at the amount of debris this is. It is also important to note that this is where McLaren think that their race was ruined. Lando Norris ended up having a piece of debris get stuck in his car. Now, he had a incident with Alex Albon, but his team had confirmed that that is not what caused his fire in pit lane. If you look here, you'll see it. He actually has to put out a fire because his tire wheel actually catches on fire. And it's because of the debris that's in there because it was too hot. Keep in mind the situation with the FIA and Michael Massey. Ferrari is still under the impression that they need to pit because that's what they told Michael Massey. Now, if you believe Michael Massey, and we have no reason to think he's lying, Mattia doesn't say anything otherwise, he's under the impression that Ferrari are going to pit. Wouldn't this new information, this new incident, this potentially life-threatening situation that just happened with their car being damaged, wouldn't that just mean even more so that they're going to pit? And if you choose to give the FIA the benefit of the doubt, well, in this situation, they'd be reasonable to think that. If Ferrari tell them they're going to pit, you have to think Ferrari is going to pit. Now, that, again, doesn't let them off the hook. They should have done their job. They shouldn't have trusted a team who's incentivized to stay out to stay out. Their job is to enforce the rules. Ferrari's garage comes back to him just in a pretty normal, casual voice and says, we need to box now. Box. Confirm. We need to box now. Box. Confirm. Now, one of two things is occurring. The engineer is trying to keep a calm, casual voice because, again, plausible deniability. Acting irrationally shows that you knew that that piece just flew off. Or, there's just really nothing you can do. It was a dangerous situation, it happened, oh well, we'll deal with it, but come into the pits. I'm going to go with the latter. But, something happens next that I think could question that fairly. So to summarize again, Leclerc says, it's not that bad. We should stay out. I know it looks bad, but let's stay out. He asks again, should I box? He likely feels something fly off his car, but he certainly feels his mirror get very, very loose all of a sudden, giving him, again, if you want to give him the benefit of the doubt, he doesn't actually see the mirror. You could look in the mirrors yourself, the one you're grabbing, and see that a bunch of cars are swerving. But again, let's just pretend he doesn't know any of those things for some reason. His team didn't tell him parts of your car are flying everywhere. The commentators won't stop talking about it. And even some of them are making fun of Hamilton complaining, which is ridiculous. And for the past five turns, Leclerc's garage has been firm to come in. I'm not going to sit here and call Leclerc out. I'm still of the point he's a driver and he's just being unsafe. That's a fact, but he's already penalized for that. I've always kind of thought this about him. When he gets in a position where he's desperate he does drive different and i don't think he drives safe and i think this is just an extension of that i'm not surprised by any of this behavior and i don't think it's particularly egregious based on what he normally does that is an excuse his behavior but that's his job and that's his nature to stay out and unless he specifically knew it almost hit hamilton i really do think he would have done this 10 out of 10 and i don't really blame him for that because that is the point of the check and balance that your team offers you are supposed to be the reasonable logical one that is looking at the upstream strategy. You are understanding the dynamics that are playing out at hand. You can see the other cars. You can see the other drivers. You have telemetry. So, and it is at this point in which Ferrari got their incredibly lenient 25000 fine. Over the radio, Leclerc's engineer frantically yells, almost shouts, stay out, stay out, stay out, three times back to back when he's going through the curves about to enter the pit lane. 
So again, they just have been telling him almost every turn that LeClaire asked, should I box? Yes, box, box, box. They saw the piece of debris. They saw the debauchery behind LeClaire. And after confirming box, LeClaire doesn't say a word. He's grabbing his mirror. He probably knows. They just shout out of nowhere. Stay out, stay out, stay out. All the while, they already told Michael Massey they're coming in. Again, I'm trusting that. So now they're choosing to not come in at the behest of Michael Massey. They're choosing to understand that a piece of his car is off and just ruined at least one driver's race, ripped off Hamilton's mirror, and could have injured him even more severely. When a piece of a car is coming off, the only thing that proves is more of the car might come off. But they chose to keep him out. Ask yourself, what would make a team tell the FIA director they're going to come in, change their course out of nowhere on their own after confirming he's going to come in, and knowing the timeline of events? Now, of course, we don't know motive. We're not there. We weren't in anyone's head. But it's pretty clear why someone would do something like that. The worst is done. And that right there deserves much more than 25,000, two points, and 15 seconds post-race. It is at this point that Michael Massey, by all accounts, is absolutely livid. Now, again, if you're still giving the FIA the benefit of the doubt, they were just made to be fools. They were just lied to, and Ferrari walked all over them. Think about the level of disrespect and the amount of control you think you have over the regulatory body that controls the sport. When you say to them you're going to box, a piece of your debris of your car flies off, almost damages a driver, ruins multiple races, and you just go, now we're good. We're just going to stay out now. But don't worry, Mattia even takes it another step further. Back in Italy, he was giving an interview and it said, the FIA called us, forcing us to stop Leclerc because the front wing had lost too many pieces. We tried to insist that he could stay out, but they forced us because Charles had already lost the pieces of the car. Let me say that again. Mattia said this after the race. We tried to insist that he could stay out. But they forced us because Charles had already lost the pieces of the car, which is unbelievable. He continues, of course he does. From the first laps, we knew that it would be a race on two stops. Right there is your proof that that was the motive. The proof was to protect the first two stops. And that's all we needed was for one of them to confirm that. Because he's calling this out with reference to why they chose not to stop. So you can reasonably make the connection. They chose not to stop because they didn't want to mess up the two-stop strategy and they were willing to risk even seeing the risk of what it would do to another driver and didn't care. And the only reason they even pitted, because you could be saying, oh, okay, that's bad, but they at least pitted. And it was literally because Michael Massey had to step in at this point because he had been made a fool. And that's when in his interview, when pushed about how he felt, he said he was a little bit more than annoyed and the sarcasm was palpable. So he went on record, and this just makes sense, but he forced them to pit. And Mattia even confirms after the race, they wouldn't have. Mattia goes on to say about how they could have won that race. He's only focused on how they were so impeded by the safety of other drivers. And now let's actually talk about the penalties themselves, why they make no sense, and why they're not even remotely in the ballpark of what they should have been or what precedents would suggest. And if you're out there and you already knew all this was true and this just made you even more upset, I hate to break it to you, but you might want to take a pause because this is really going to put you over the edge. Leclerc was given two penalties by the FIA for the turn one incident with Max. Initially, it was deemed that there was no investigation necessary, which is fine. They're perfectly within their rights and purview to overturn that. It's the way they did it. The FIA came out and said, we received, I'm not making this quote up. We received new footage. What new footage possibly could they have gotten that we didn't have that they didn't have before how can you receive new footage you're the fia what footage is new they were given information that made their change their minds what would make you wait an extra three hours to make the call it's the perfect storm of incompetence if you're given new information that forces you to change your mind that same information should be the impetus to make the call itself 
and this matters a great deal. I'm not mincing words. Let me ask you another question. How many times has a driver been investigated on turn one incident and waited until after the race? Go ahead and look that up. See when that's ever happened. Again, in a vacuum, just by itself, not a big deal. Go ahead and count them. But when you have situations like that, and then you also have them openly admitting they got new footage, okay? Why did you wait? Why would it take that long? Because I can tell you from a rules perspective, if you were looking for something, why it'd be very easy to point out why someone would wait and be very convenient why you'd wait twice on two clear penalties that gave you the reason to overturn your initial think. In reference to turn one incident, they cite that he was penalized with five seconds in accordance to Article 38.3, parentheses D. Now, I went ahead and linked to the actual rules themselves down in the description below so you could actually see what I'm saying and I'm not making it up, but there you go. It's straight from the FIA from the rules document. So there's your source. But in case you wanted me to just tell you, 38.3 parentheses D actually says a 10 second stop and go time penalty. The driver must enter the pit lane, stop in his pit, stop position for at least 10 seconds and then rejoin the race. Which even first of all, the second I heard that is weird because the portion of this violation was supposed to be five seconds, 10 seconds or however even you do this, they were saying it's on Ferrari, which again, falls outside the precedents and norms of penalties, but whatever, we just let it go. But this part was supposed to be five seconds. So I saw a couple people talking about this and that's when I started making this sort of video because all these things before were just, you know, weird. I can be cynical. I was going to let it go. But now this is too much. Now, the only publication I saw that really pushed them and got a response was race fans. And their response is jaw dropping. What they say is it was a mistake. It was incorrectly cited. So let's stop for a second. They had the incident occur. They took the entire race. They were looking at it as it played out live. They huddled as a team and they ended up writing an error in written form on an official document about an important event in that race. So they came back after they made the error and said, yes, it was a mistake. What we meant to say was without the clause of D. So go ahead and understand that for a second. In their clarification, they simply left it at 38.3. Very interesting, because if it was a simple mistake, wouldn't you be motivated to fix it? The FIA does not make rulings in which they do not call out why they made the ruling. So they messed up the actual citation. They went on to say, our bad. And then they didn't even bother making the clarification. The point of this video is not to insert my bias. I'm not going to say what I think happened or my conspiracy because I can't prove it. I can just prove this much. I can prove that that's beyond a reasonable doubt of logical rationale. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever why you would do that. First of all, it doesn't make any sense to mess up that ruling. In writing, clearly when you go out of your way to call out the specific incident. And then it doesn't make any sense that it was an incident in which maybe even five seconds was used. Someone had to read the wrong rule. Everyone look at it and shake their head, look at the rules and go, yep, that's it. But let's progress in the story because of course there's more. It is very odd to put a 10 second time penalty on a driver while also trying to pin some of it on the team. That doesn't make any sense. And I looked through all the rules. It's happened sometimes, but it's pretty clear on what happens and why they penalize who and for what. But here they muddy it up, and I think it's to spread the blame, to make it seem, oh, don't worry, Leclerc was given 15 seconds. Well, no, he was given five seconds, incorrectly cited, and never actually fixed. And then he was, the whole team as a Ferrari were given 10 plus 25,000. Not to mention his two points. I'm not even going to go down the line of all the incidents this year, which have garnered three points of the drivers. But hey, it was 25,000. That's huge, right? That's got to be the most. Let's take a look at last season. Is that near enough? You know, ripping off mirrors, walking all over the race director, pushing people around on the track, knocking them out of the race in their home race, lighting cars on fire. Surely 25,000. Let's top them all. Well, in 2018, Kimi doubled it. Remember back in Bahrain where Kimi and Ferrari got a 50,000 euro fine in 2018 for their unsafe release? Oh, that's a one-time thing, though. They didn't happen again. Well, Lance Stroll got 25,000 for what? an unsafe release in Mexico in 2018. Okay, okay, but no one got significantly more. Kimmy the once, that was a fluke. Nope, you'd be wrong. Sergio with a whopper 
in France in practice in FP2 got a 100,000 euro fine. So when you start to think about 25,000 and what happened, Sergio's wheel came off once, 100,000. Lance Stroll unsafe release, 25. Kimi, 50 unsafe release. Think about that. The unsafe release is there to protect the drivers. It's there to incentivize safety and de-incentivize rush behavior would put another driver at risk. At risk is the key point. Stay out, stay out, stay out. But what happened with Ferrari? They purposefully ignored. This doesn't even really happen to have precedent. The only time this is really cited is Nico Rosberg. Remember when he hit Lewis Hamilton? And that was a huge deal. The only issue was that was on his last lap. So instead of going to pit lane, he crossed the line. And at the time, that was huge because all the same things we're saying about Ferrari now were said then except times three. And now the amount of danger is exponentially higher in what Ferrari did. Choosing to ignore the race director, knowing the ruining races, half the road is covered in Leclerc's car, just stayed out and would have stayed out openly admitted. And they were given less than Sergio's wheel falling off in practice. So incorrectly citing the rules, not even clarifying. So we still don't even know. Waiting conveniently until the end of the race in which the exact same penalty time can be added and you think about why, well, what happens when you get 15 extra seconds in a race where your lapse times aren't compromised? If he has to stop mid-race, how many, how many more seconds is that to do a pit stop? 22, 23, depending on the race? That much amount of time, and you have to fight through the crowd even more so? Seems very convenient. Think about all the times people were given in race penalties. Think about Canada. And that's if you're not even given a stop go. If you're given a stop go, that should be a little bit more aggressive of a you know, violation. You would think this might warrant that. But if he had been given a 10 second stop go and it was delivered after the race, guess what had happened? 30 extra seconds. Very convenient that they didn't clarify what these were. But it couldn't have made that big a difference, right? Of course it did. That gave him six extra points. That's a nice little haul for the day. Knocking out the person next to you. I'm not implying you did it on purpose. Never mind the fact that Vettel was given the tremendous opportunity to tie up Max now, with Max getting no points and Vettel getting all the points he did. Ferrari not at any other risk than 25000 which pretty sure they can pay that in cash the second before they get in on the flight. Two points, which allows you to get five incidents because it's 12 before a ban, three is the max. And on top of all that, what it says is you are putting a price on risk. Think about it. Would Ferrari pay 25000 for six points to go nine clear and to get their other driver tied for fourth and back in the race? You bet they would. What team boss, if they had a shot and all they had to do was pay 25000 wouldn't do something like that? Wouldn't risk keeping their team out there? For the FIA, actually not even almost penalizing them. He got 10 seconds. 10 seconds, not a stop go. Think about that. A stop goes is a more aggressive penalty. Now, I know this video is long, but it's really important. And this video took the whole week. This is one of those stories that's going to go down as a weird moment. But I think it should be more than that. And you were a part of it. You saw it live. You got to listen to this context. I'm just here to find it, package it, and deliver it to you. You make the call. You check the sources. But if you like any of this, and you like this sort of content, you like being challenged, and you got to remember... The season won't go on forever. It will be over. And you're going to want interesting stuff like this. So go ahead and subscribe. Let me know. I would love for someone to prove all of this wrong. Show me where it is. This is exactly what I, I don't get paid for this. I don't make a dollar. I lose a lot of money, actually, because I'm not doing my real job. So tell me where I could have fixed this. Tell me what you would like to see in the future. But this is F1 Wars. Look out for the podcast. It's currently, of course, being challenged right now so i've got to make sure that it stands and then it'll be up on apple i'll put it up on spotify and all that too but i'll leave a link when it's ready the blog's almost done it's six thousand words so i got to cut it down but the, the point is this is really important and i could have been making a mountain of a molehill but i personally don't think so and after looking back after all the work and kind of staring at this i'm actually really happy with it and i think it's important i think it matters and i think you'll like it too so let me know if you want to say anything in the future let me know if something doesn't make sense and you want clarification. Let me know if you want further proof or you want some more of the documents. But this is Cranky Yankee F1. This is F1 Wars. Thanks for checking this out. And I will see you very soon.